Holmes, thank you very much indeed for coming on to chat with us on Evolution Soup. You are a paleoanthropologist and a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto's Department of Anthropology, and your main interest is in the evolutionary history of ancient primates from millions of years ago. Now, that's a pretty unusual subject, but one, as we'll see, leads right into human beings and human evolution. So, how did you get interested in this subject? Okay, well, it started actually, I was in my, uh, my mid to late 20s, and I remember seeing this uh, picture of a pygmy marmoset. You know, like they're like a really, really small monkey. I, I think I saw it in like the palm of someone's hand, or maybe wrapped around their finger like that. And it just, uh, you know, I, I knew we were related to primates, but it was just fascinated. It's like that it was so small. And really, in the grand scheme of things, I knew it wasn't that distantly related, right? So now I know that I've gone and studied this stuff that we, that I would have shared a common ancestor with this uh, uh, pygmy marmoset probably about 40 million years ago or so. But it's just, uh, you know, because I was kind of getting interested in evolution and, and that just seemed really fascinating to me. So um, then I went and I got myself a degree in uh, archaeology and a minor in biology. Uh, then uh, I did that at uh, Memorial U uh, University in Newfoundland. And then um, I came uh, to Toronto to work with uh, David Begun, and he works on uh, Miocene apes. And so that's kind of what, I, what I'm working on here, primates from the Miocene, yeah. So when we say the Miocene, we're talking about 5 million years ago around that time, is that right? All the way back to 23 million years ago and up to about 5 million years ago. So you can see it's a, it's a pretty big uh, chunk of time. And there's, there's really a lot of uh, really important things in, human evolution, primate evolution that happened during the, this period. So uh, towards the end of the Miocene, that's where you see the emergence of the first uh, uh, hominins work, walking on two legs, like, you know, our, our more immediate ancestors. But if you go further back into the Miocene, you see other really interesting points of divergence. Um, my, my, re my research really just folk goes all the way back and focuses um, uh, more like uh, the, the kind of bigger lineages of, of monkeys and apes and when they wait when they diversified from each other. Right. So what are the differences between apes and monkeys? And when did this divergence take place? The easiest way to tell a monkey from an ape is, is whether it has a tail or not. So monkeys, they have ta they have tails, apes don't. There's some monkeys that have a really small tail, but it's, but it's still there. Um, and so that, that's useful when we look at the fossil record to tell us when the first apes emerge. And that seems to be somewhere around 20 million years ago, maybe a bit before that. But we have really clear apes at 20 million years ago. Uh, named Akimbo and Proconsul. But the thing is, this is bring up an interesting point with the whole monkey ape thing, right? Because it's a bit of an artifact of the English language. Because if you, um, you know, in languages like French and Spanish, they don't have separate words for monkey and ape. If you look at like the, the original Plan of the Apes book, which is written by Pierre Boulle, it's, uh, what's it called? Uh, La Planète de, yeah, uh, La Planète de Sange, right? Yeah. Um, de Sange. I always get corrected. I always pronounce that word wrong with my French friends. I think it, I think it's Sange. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so so the, the point is there is, is uh, we kind of think of apes as being closely related to us and then monkeys off in this other category unto themselves. But the, the truth kind of is, is there's two different kinds of monkeys, really. There's old world monkeys and there's new world monkeys. So the new world monkeys are actually the ones that are older. They would have branched off. Uh, much earlier, about 40 uh, million years ago or so, right? And then um, you have the uh, the old world monkeys, or we call them circopithecoids, and they're actually more closely related to apes, and so that's the divergence that happens around 20 million years ago, the split between those guys. So we, we kind of use this word monkey, but it's what we call like an artificial taxon, because the more close relationship is between the old world monkeys and apes, so that's a real, uh, you know, taxonomic group. And we say real when we mean it's based on like an evolutionary phylogeny, like a family tree. And then monkeys is kind of like just a category. It's not really an evolutionary group. Where does your research fit into this picture primate or anthropoid evolution? 
Yeah, okay. So these guys, when we're talking monkeys and apes, those are all anthropoids. And you can contrast against that, uh, against things like lemurs and lorises and galagos. That that was a divergence that happened way, way before. So in my, my uh, the stuff that I look at, as, um, if, we, if we think about the, um, the old world monkeys branching off, or sorry, the uh, New World monkeys branching off 40 million years ago, and then the uh, then the um, circumpithecoids and apes splitting apart around 20 million years ago. I'm looking at a group that diverges out between those. So it's after the uh, the New World monkeys split off, but before the Old World monkeys split off. And they're called pliopithecoids. So there's actually all these different primates because we just think about these three kind of groups of anthropoids today. But in the, in the past, there was tons of different types of anthropoids. So the pliopithecoids are, are one of them. So they're like a group of medium-sized primates. They're probably about the size of like a gibbon today. Um, but their bodies would have looked a lot more like a, like a monkey in terms of having proportional arms and legs. They didn't have real long arms or anything like that. So they, they lived across Europe and Asia uh, from 18 million years ago to about uh, 6 million years ago. Um, so they're not really direct ancestors of any living primates. Like the plaquepithecoids have gone extinct and they, they leave no uh, descendants on, on our planet. But what they're really into, there's a number of things I find interesting about them. And one of them in relation to humans is because they branch off between those two groups of monkeys um, and before the split between the old world monkeys and the apes, they can tell us a lot about what the common ancestor of the old world monkeys and apes was kind of like. Because th this guy represents a point that branches out before that. Yeah. We should uh, actually get more into the nitty gritty of the pliopithecoids, which is, of course, your main field of interest. So, first of all, Andrew, how would you define a pliopith? They're both medium sized primates. Um, and the thing is, we mostly know about them from teeth, right? Like I have around me all these different uh, casts of teeth. So that gives you an idea of how big they are right there. That's a mandible from a species called Epipliopithecus uh, bimbobonensis. I have another one here. This is one from Hungary called uh, Anapithecus herniacii. So it gives you a rough idea of how big they were in reference. They've to got that. some great names, Andrew. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They get <laughs> they get some real tongue twisters too, like oh, uh, God, Plesi yeah. plesiopithecus, uh, you know, locri. Because they're mostly known from their teeth, right? We don't actually know a whole lot about what they look like. There's really only a few species that we have any facial kind of material of. So one of them I have right here is uh, this one's called Lacopithecus from China. Mm -hmm. So as you can see with this guy, it's kind of you know, he's got a relatively short face. It's not really long yeah. and prog prognathic like some, uh, you know, some monkeys, like a baboon has a really long face, or even chimpanzees have a much longer face than that. And prognathic um, means protruding, like, like yeah, 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 st yeah, yeah, sticking out, right, like protruding, yeah. So, you know, um, and we had, there's some really, really nice skeletons that are really well preserved, the, the Epipliopithecus species. So that can tell us a lot of things. Now, while they didn't find the actual tailbones with Epipliopithecus, uh, we ha there's enough of the uh, sacrum that you're able to determine that Epipliopithecus did, uh, did in fact have a tail. So that, so that's uh, you know interesting because we know that the uh, it, it makes sense that they would have a tail if we think of them being divergent be between uh, you know old world monkeys and apes because apes haven't really lost their tail yet there, and that also kind of helps us fit the plyopiths into the family tree because at one time people used to think of them as the uh, ancestors of the of the gibbons because they do share a lot of similarities with the gibbons but is that we also find these primitive features in the plyopiths that we know that they must be much earlier so they have a really primitive elbow, for example, because hmm. uh, humans, you know, like when you hit your elbow on something and you get like that kind of funny bone feeling. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we can get that and apes can get that and old world monkeys get that. But earlier primates and the new world monkeys, what, what don't have, they're actually protected from that because they're um, the ulnar nerve that runs through. That's essentially what you're hitting when you hit your funny bone okay. is uh, kind of runs outside, whereas in uh, New World monkeys and the pliopus, it's actually encased in bone, uh, which is a bit more protected. Us not having it protected actually gives us a wider range of movement and, and stuff like that, like, you know, when you're moving through the trees. So there's good reason for losing it. But uh, so the pliopus didn't uh, still had that uh, intact. So, you know, they wouldn't have been able to hit their funny bone. Good so that, job. yeah, there's, you know, some good, uh, there's, there's definite advantages to that as well. So all these things, essentially, they tell us about the position of the pliopiths relative to 
the groups that we know from both the fossil record and, and from living primates. And so um, then what my research is, because we know there's all these different species of platypus, there's somewhere between like 18, 19 different, maybe 20 different species. And there's probably a lot more than that that actually live. Those are the ones we have the fossils of, right? right. And, you know, fossils is, you're just uh, getting a small sample of what was really there. But of those different species, what my research looks at is like, how are all, all those different species related to each other? So there's little subfamilies and uh, families and different groups within them because they, you know, they were really widespread all the way. They find them all the way over in Catalonia and Spain and all the way to uh, north, uh, be northeastern China. So they're spread all across. And so how did they spread? Like, when did they come in? Where did they go? Which patterns did, you know, did they follow uh, all across the landscape? So we kind of sort this out by looking at how they're related to each other. I guess you could say that these plyopiths feature in our own past. In, in human evolution. Where would you say that this group figures on the family tree in relation to human beings? We sh would have all shared a common ancestor. Um, it's exactly hard to say when that would have been. So you know the whole monkey-ape split between the old world monkeys and the apes. That was like, you know, around 25, 20 million years, somewhere in there. And we know that the earlier monkeys, the new world monkeys, branched off from around 40 million years. So we have a, like a little window there. The thing that gets it hard to piece together is uh, we don't know really about the f initial emergence of the platypus. We find the earliest ones in China at 18 million years ago. and But everything else in the fossil record tells us that, that they would have been related to something that was still in Africa. And, uh, you know, Africa uh, was, wasn't uh, attached up. To, uh, to Asia and, the, in, and uh, to Europe until the, uh, the Middle Miocene, right? That's when we see apes, because, you know, Europe is full of apes as well, and apes expanded all up into there. But it's actually the, the platypus that we see there first. They're in Eurasia before the apes. But there is a real big fossil gap there. There's, a, you know, close to 10 million years. We have all this stuff in Egypt, and there's stuff in East Africa, and then there's really not a whole lot of what, how we title the platypus in until they pop up suddenly kind of in China. So um, all that being said, to, to know how they relate to, to humans is, uh, as I said, they, they kind of branch off between the two monkey groups so they can tell us about that. And they fit somewhere in there, somewhere between, you know, probably between 30 million years ago to 20 million years ago is probably where they branched off. That's where we would share a common ancestor with them. If one is primarily interested in human evolution, why would it be useful to study primates that lived millions and millions of years before humans even existed? Well, it's a good question because, you know, um, I'm, in, I'm in an anthropology department, right? That's where I, where I do my research at the uh, University of Toronto. And the anthropology means, yeah, the study of humans. And so what am I doing studying these, these, these monkeys, essentially, you know, uh, these plyopis from millions and millions of years ago? Well, if you want to know about anything in evolution, if you want to know anything about humans and study their evolution, you always have to kind of know what came before them. So, again, informing us about that common ancestor tells us about traits we would have had back then. Just the, the similar way, if you, if you want to study something more recent in, in human evolution, um, recent in the context of the fossil record, we say uh, something like you know, people are always interested in... in um, when did humans start walking on, on two legs? When, when did this? Because it's a you know, really unique trait of our, our species, right? Uh, so you can, you can see the emergence of that in the fossil record. It happened somewhere around 7 million years ago. We see the species called Silanthropus chadensis. And, it's, and you know, it's got a, a frame and magnum, which is the hole in the bottom of your skull where your spine goes in, essentially. Um, in in uh, Chimpanzees, you know, it's on the back of the skull back here, but in humans, where it got, our uh, foramen magnum is underneath, right, because the spine attaches in like this because we're walking on two legs. So we see this in Silanthropus seven million years ago. That gives us a date we know humans were walking around by then, right? And we think about the chimpanzee-human split, all the genetic evidence and the fossil evidence we have seems to suggest it's around, you know, seven, eight million years ago. Um, and so if you want to study the early forms of bipedalism, you can find it in Silanthropus, you can find it in species that come after that, Artipithecus and the Ostropus. But if you want to know how it evolved, you have to look before, right? And that's really important. So you want to look at the, you know, the late Miocene apes that uh, might have evolved, you know, that would have been the ancestors of humans. And you, so, because if you want to know, like, how did this emerge, we have to know the positional behavior from which it 
came from before. So there's different theories about that. Some people think we would have evolved from a knuckle walking ape. Hmm. Um, some people think we would have walked, uh, maybe our ancestor walked in trees on its feet and grabbed things. Maybe something kind of like a gibbon. That's one idea that's out there. Um, but if you want to get to these ideas, you want to explore these ideas, you have to look before them, right? So looking back deeper in time, you're just looking at more fundamental questions about, you know, the kind of human uh, human anatomy, like where did this emerge from? Like the elbow thing I was telling you about. If you want to know about the funny bone, we have to understand that that's something that happened, you know, somewhere around 20 million years ago that that evolved. And there was a reason for that and was probably for giving you increased maneuverability in the trees, you know? Andrew, people are interested in that time over six or seven million years ago when we had this common ancestor with chimpanzees and then that line split with the ape species on one branch and hominids on the other, put it simply. Uh, but what isn't asked enough is how that split may have happened. Could it have been a mutation or a geographical separation or, I don't know, a combination? What do you think? Um, well, I mean, yeah, if, you're, if you've got evolution taking place, it's going to require some genetic mutations because they just take, you know, genetic mutations play, take place all the time. And, you know, some are harmful, some are neutral, and then a few of them are beneficial. You know, they, they'll change the population over time. If this is a beneficial trade, it'll make its way through. Uh, and, you know, um, but if we're talking about the splitting of two two different species, you need some sort of barrier between, you need to be able to create two populations, right? Because you just have one population. It's going to be all the genes in that population are going to be kind of floating throughout it, right? We're not going to have anything real distinct emerge. So you need some sort of geographical separation. And once that occurs, then you'll have one population kind of with its own mutations and its own kind of genetic flow running through it. And you'll have another population and, they'll, and over time, the uh, the longer those two populations are separated from each other, you'll see the you'll see the emergence of a of two new species. Right, the species are always splitting. You know, there's this old idea of kind of linear evolution. You see, like in the pictures of the ascent of man of like a monkey, and then he's like oh, yeah. a little bit upright and stuff like that. Like that that illustration is is it's not really good. I've never thought of it as a good way to describe evolution because it's just too linear. Right, and it doesn't show the fact that every time there's that species emerge, you probably there's two species emerging. You know, there's a split in this population. So, from what we can tell from you know all different fields of biology, that really seems to necessitate a ge geographical separation. So there's some ideas about that in regards to humans and chimps. Uh, we find you know a lot of the early um, human fossils in in East Africa. Um, but the thing is, we don't, we're not finding any chimpanzee fossils. There's really no chimpanzee fossil record. Hmm. Uh, we're talking, you know, eight million years. I think there's a couple teeth, maybe three, three, four teeth that show up around 500,000 years ago. So that's relatively recent. We're missing like eight million years of the chimpanzee fossil record. Same with gorillas. We don't know hardly anything about the the evolution. We have no real good fossil gorilla material. Um, so you know, we can only tell the, we can only kind of speculate. On what happened here because we don't even know where the ancestors of the chimpanzees were one idea it's actually tells us why we might have this kind of artifact in the in the fossil record of not being able to find chimpanzees and that is the east african rift valley is a really good place mm -hmm. for fossils to fossilize you know um, the conditions are just right. That's why they find so many fossils. You know, the Rift Valley runs all the way up the east coast of Africa, and you find fossils all along there. You find them down in South Africa as well. These are really good fossil conditions. Um, if you look at where chimpanzees are living today, they're more towards West Africa. There's not a lot of good fossil sites over there. I mean, there's not... Uh, well, there might be. I mean, large parts of it haven't been really explored in reference to the fossil record. So who knows? But we, you know... First of all, there's not a lot of uh, work going on over there in terms of looking for the fossils. And and, and then secondly, it, not really the best conditions for, for fossilization, as you hmm. might think. So maybe parts of their fossil record are, you know, completely lost. Maybe someday we'll find some more stuff. There's already been, you know, in the past 10, 15 years, as people have shifted their focus towards, um, you know, a little bit more west, like getting into Chad and stuff, people have found species there. Like Solanthropus we talked about, that is... You know, that's a little bit more. There's a species of uh, Australopithecus that's also been found in Chad. 
So who knows? Uh, but to uh, answer, to get a good idea of, of this idea of geographical separation, we're really going to need to find the chimpanzee fossils. So uh, until then, yeah. my, my guess is, yeah, maybe they're more in places we haven't looked yet. And so maybe that will tell us about how it happened. Well, that's the thing about fossils. It's just that perhaps they are there and they, we just haven't found them yet. Or in, indeed, perhaps they have been found and they're sitting in a drawer somewhere. Because <laughs> you never know with fossils, do you? Oh, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, yeah, people find fossils of things I didn't think about that were anything at any given time in fossil drawers all the time. You know, that's what I'm kind of thinking about. Uh, you ever hear of Gigantopithecus? It was a giant ape. Oh, yes. It's just a, it's just a mandible they found in that. Yeah. Scene. So there's, yeah, there's some individual teeth too, because the guy who found it originally found it like in an apothecary shop. You know, people would grind these teeth up to make magic that's potions right. and stuff, right? So they found some teeth and some, and there's some, there's, a, I think, a couple mandibles now. But we don't have any of their postcrania. We don't have any of their bones, their their arms, their legs, their bodies, anything. Uh, or you might. The thing is, is like an ape that big, when the fossils were getting collected, might, if we found like a femur of a Gigantopithecus, because it's so big and weird, it might have just got shoved in a drawer because it doesn't, yeah. might not think to think of like, even check that primate this big. Maybe someone thought it was like, oh, this is some old bear leg or something. And it's stuck in some drawer. Some, so, you know, you make a very good point. We might have found some fossils and just not figured it out yet, too. That would be very exciting if that uh, happens uh, in our lifetime anyway, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, something I think that we got to talk about uh, because it's so controversial is the primate known as Eda. Now, this was a fossil find that was announced to the world in 2009, and the press quickly named it the missing link, of course exactly what we were discussing in the previous question. So what is your take on, on Ida and what exactly is she? Okay. Um, well, yeah, it wasn't just the press that uh, called it the, the missing link, right? If I, I got a copy of the book here that came out at the time of the publication, and the book's actually called The Link. So this isn't the research. This is more about the discovery and, and tells you a little bit about, uh, you know, where the fossil came from and the history of it. And then, then the, um, the author, you know, the, the researchers, working on this, put out an idea um, with their original paper, and they suggested that uh, Ida um, is the, uh, you know, kind of like the missing link that it tells us about the uh, the anthropoids, so the monkeys and the apes, you know, the, the group that I look at. They, yes. they, they were uh, saying that uh, that this fossil species, which, found, which is a really complete, beautiful fossil, like you've never, there's nothing like it in the fossil records, the most complete primate you know, anywhere that anyone's ever found. Um, so they say it's the ancestor of the anthropoid lineage and at 47 million years ago. So they'd say that, you know, uh, this is what gave rise to monkeys and apes eventually down the line. So, you know, that's one idea. That's the idea of the, of the researchers that published it. Since that publication came out, I believe like 2009, so about 10 years ago, a lot of different people have looked at it. And I think there's, probably a lot more researchers who seem to suggest it's actually what we call an adapiform. And that's that's a group of primates that's much more closely related to the strepturine primates, like the lemurs and the lorises, right? So if you look at it, you can make this big division in the in the primate family tree between um, what we'd say that the strepturines, and strepturines means wet-nosed. So your things like your lemurs, lorises, um, you know, galagos, they all have like kind of like this split lip and this, this wet nose, amongst other different characters. But the divergence between those and, and the uh, antipoids happened, you know, sometime, um, probably probably even before 47 million years ago, right? Uh, but uh, as, as more and more scientists have been able to take a look at Ida, they've kind of seemed to suggest that um, that it's in, it's in a day performance, more closely related to lemurs than it is the anthropoids. But, you know, there's a lot of different comp competing theories still about where the anthropoids emerge from. Um, you know, there's some people who say that it, uh, we have this species in China called Eosimus, which might be the ancestor of the anthropoids. Um, I've read the evidence of that. I'm, a, I'm more compelled to, to really think that Eosimus, even though it's a much less complete uh, fossil specimen, probably is a better representative of an a earlier anthropoid uh, than, than, the, uh, than the Ida fossil, which they call uh, Darwinius, because it was named, uh, named the year of uh, you know, the 150th uh, anniversary of uh, the public publication of the origin of species, right, back in 2009. And Eosimus sounds like they, I mean, that, that probably translates to like dawn ape or something like that, which- Yeah, dawn monkey, that, yeah, that's exactly what it means, because yeah- they, they thought it was- 
Yeah, they, they yeah. suggested it's the dawn of the, the monkeys, the dawn of the anthropoids, right? Um, yeah. And it might be, you know, there's other, there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of literature out there that's been debating these points, and there's other, there's other theories as well um, about, uh, you know, where the anthropoids come from. But uh, you know, it's it's one thing that a lot of people are still working on. And, uh, but I think the, the larger consensus of, of researchers would say in reference to Ida, it's probably closer to the lorises and the lemurs and the, what we call the structurons. Yeah. So a cousin to us, not a direct uh, ancestor to us. Yeah, well, that's the thing. That's still cool, too. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of people, I think, they always want to find something related to humans that is like a direct ancestor to us. And there's always like, you know, when researchers find new fossils, there's always this kind of idea that, oh, I found something that's really going to tell us about, you know, directly about us. And, uh, you know, um, I think the thing is we, we can forget is like, yeah, it, just because like the, with the Plyopithecoids, they're not an ancestor of us. We didn't evolve from Plyopithecoids, but that doesn't still mean like they're still really cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they're, 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 uh, it, they're not just cool because they're related to us somehow. It's because they're a really interesting group of primates. We don't have anything like them on the planet anymore, um, that they are unique. And so just understanding them for their own, you know, for the sake of understanding them is, is kind of cool, I think. Excellent. Okay, Andrew, thank you so much for all those fascinating insights. I can see why you're so captivated by the subject. Um, I will leave links in the description below for anyone who wants to follow you and your work. So uh, what's left to say is uh, what's on the horizon for you, perhaps a paper or, I don't know, maybe a, a book in the works. Uh, yeah, well, not a book anytime soon. I'm still working on my PhD, right? So uh, yeah. the, the next thing that I'm going to hopefully have coming out is a few papers. I've got a, a few in the works right now. And so, um, you know, hopefully by uh, by early next year, we'll, we're going to see some of my research on the, uh, the phylogeny of the plyopithecoids. And then uh, there's a really interesting uh, specimen uh, called Plesio plyopithecus lockeri, which I'm doing some interesting research on as well. So... Wow. Yeah. Quite a mouthful, that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's fun to learn how to say them, though, I must say. Yeah, and, you know, I think with some species, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing them correctly. I'm just hoping, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's uh, another one, uh, Plesio plyopithecus ossidiensis. It's like, Ooh, I like that. Yeah, but I don't know if that's the correct way, but uh, no one's corrected me yet when I've given <laughs> talks. Probably because no one else really studies these guys too much, so I can kind of get away with just like uh, fudging my own pronunciations until someone corrects me, that is. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, Andrew Holmes, thank you very much indeed. All right, thank you very much.